I uh, just want to go over some things that I've been doing and uh, my graduate project as well. So first off, I just want to give you a face to what the community is. This is Allison Robinson. Allison is the blonde on the left. Allison uh, was a West Point graduate. She also uh, was a Baptist uh, ordained minister. Um, Allison was the deputy, deputy director of diversity for the human rights campaign and actually served as the first transgender female for OutServe, which um, is an advocacy group for service members of uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender women. This is Eric Alva. Eric uh, joined the military in 1990 when being gay or lesbian open about your sexual orientation was not allowed. So when Eric got involved, he was um, he spent about 13 years in the military and actually was the first uh, Marine wounded in the Iraq War. Eric then served as a spokesperson for the Human Rights Campaign and their Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal and was actually instrumental in that, that work. This is uh, Dana Goldberg. Dana Goldberg is uh, noted to be the t one of the top five funniest lesbians in the nation uh, by Curve Magazine. Uh, she is uh, from Albuquerque, New Mexico, but she actually resides in Los Angeles and uh, continues to hold uh, her annual Funny Fest in which one of, uh, a lot of the proceedings go to AIDS research. <coughs> and this is Reverend Garner on the left with the long dress. Um, Reverend Garner is uh, the minister at the Metropolitan Community Church in Washington, D.C. and is a co-founder of the National Coalition of Black Lesbians and Gays. And, uh, Reverend Garner and her now wife Candy were one of the first uh, three couples in the Washington DC to get married. So I really just wanted to give you a face to what the community looks like and who are the patients that we're going to serve. Uh, Dana is a personal friend of mine and uh, you'll know what Darlene Garner and I have in common in a while. And Allison Robinson and I actually presented the Trans Health Conference together um, in years past. So there's about 9 million um, LGBT people that actually um, are out. Uh, over 9 million, this is from 2011, and almost 700,000 transgender people. So regardless of where you live in the United States, we're going to face the community in some way or another. So give you a little round about me. Um, this is me when I was very little. Uh, I grew up in central Pennsylvania. I spent most of my time riding motorcycles with my father, as you can see in his amazing hairdo. Um, <laughs> this is, this is um, when I got, um, I graduated with a bachelor's in social work and during my time as a social worker I got involved uh, with the human rights campaign and led a lot of community outreach in the Philadelphia area. Um, so this is one of the pride events which I, is one of the fun things. This is Allison Robinson and I when we presented the Trans Health Conference together. We presented on self-care for advocates and activists and how to care for yourself during that time. Um, I presented at the 2012 uh, HRC Philadelphia Gala um, and was um, kind of just my story and how uh, going to PA school has really led my advocacy work. And then it led me to PA school. And when I was looking to either go on for my master's or choose a different route, I decided that medicine was my choice. And so I started, um, I only applied to one school, probably um, not many people would do that, but I love Drexel's program and I'm a huge advocate for Drexel. So the reason that I'm involved really is because um, in 2000, well, before I started PA school, I was married. And um, Darlene Garner, Reverend Darlene Garner, was actually the uh, officiant for our ceremony in DC. And so uh, this really is what leads me to want to have a family and the health disparities that my family could face being a part of the community. So to understand the present, we must first understand the past. And I think this is really crucial to knowing um, the community that we serve. I mean, in the 1960s and 70s, it was really viewed upon that this was a, a curable disease, that there was an illness in which needed to be addressed with some sort of um, intervention, whether that be um, shock therapy, whether that be lobotomies, unfortunately. The, um, a lot of families would actually involuntarily com commit their family members to kind of cure, cure this illness. Um, and the APA did have homosexuality as a part of their DSM, their Diagnostic Standard Manual, until 1973. Um, and the uh, statement that I found was that the APA deplores all public and private discrimination against homosexuals and, and urges the enactment of civil rights legislation that would ensure homosexual citizens the same protections. And this was their way of saying this is, we were wrong for the, what we had in the DSM, and this is what we feel is the right position to take. Um, unfortunately, after 1973, um, there started really an ex-gay movement um, with a community called Love in Action, and um, 
sub subsequent other organizations like that really believe that counseling, the way to you know, uh, have a holistic counseling for an individual to kind of, again, cure them of this same sex tendency or gender identity. Um, and for the community in general, um, in my experience, I've met so many people that have been a part of this ex-gay movement and the really traumatic, uh, almost PTSD that it can cause to these individuals. And these are the people that we're, that again, we're treating. So we want to move forward. This is what is in the past. This is why we need to address this topic. So what are we moving forward about? The uh, Health and Human Services released a uh, national prevention strategy stating that we need a more culturally competent workforce and more data. Um, as far as the people that are here, we're public health and we're clinicians. So what are, these are the, the two areas that they stated and these are the two areas that uh, as Drexel we can address. So uh, as far as interdisciplinary services, Fenway uh, Health Center is actually um, a model for an interdisciplinary approach to LGBT healthcare. Uh, they have an under one roof uh, methodology where everything that you would need to treat a patient is, is under one roof. If it's social services, if it's family care, if it's family planning, if it's legal services, they have this really beautiful approach to LGBT healthcare and it really can be used in other, in other ways. So Drexel actually has an interdisciplinary forum, I'm not sure if any of you guys have attended before, um, where they have a dinner and discussion about a certain topic. And in January, we had a panel of um, discussing LGBT healthcare. There was a, someone from the Mazzoni Center and someone from uh, the Attic Youth Center and some Drexel um, public health uh, professors that really spoke to how we can encourage this interdisciplinary approach like the Fenway Health Center for our patients. So we also need a more culturally competent youth uh, workforce. So HRC actually has a healthcare quality index, and they rate uh, medical providers and institutions on uh, patient non-discrimination policies, equal visitation, employment non-discrimination, and training in LGBT-centered care. So this is a standard. We are held to a greater standard, and these are published um, every year. And uh, for institutions that are listed, you know, get a priority. As, as consumers, I want to know that the institution that I'm going to is going to care for my family in the way that it needs to be. So Jeffrey Creeley of the Center for American Progress stated that given the dearth of training and educational re resources and information, that it really needs to have this priority in the medical schools and nursing students, so in our programs. So equal curriculum. Um, I was invited to be an author for um, a first ever uh, LGBT health textbook. Um, the chapter that I'm, I'm an author for is the uh, chapter 15, Interdisciplinary Approach to LGBT Healthcare. So in my future, my previous career as a social worker and my future career as a physician assistant, um, it really lends me to kind of see it from two different worlds. So uh, we're currently in the literature review stage. We finished our literature review. We're looking to start uh, chapter writing and look to be published next year, which is really, really exciting for the community. Um, it's through GLAMA, which is the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association, through the Association for American Medical Colleges, and through um, Stanford's uh, LGBT research group. So those are the three uh, groups. Um, so we all, um, there's a few, there's usually two students per chapter, and then there's uh, a lot of um, either members of those organizations or other faculty that are involved. So this is my class. Um, when I started the Equal Curriculum, I thought, okay, I have this textbook, but who would use it? You know, who's going to actually implement these changes and this kind of approach to LGBT healthcare? And I thought about my future career and the students that were um, producing and the growth of physician assistants across the country. So for my graduate project, I am proposing to the Physician Assistant Educational Association an inclusive approach to LGBT health care in education. So how can we include not just a two-hour session, but really within our curriculum, um, within SP encounters, within case studies, within our actual program development, our faculty, our uh, admissions process. Um, so this is, and I hope to present um, this at the PAEA's um, annual conference, which is actually held in Philadelphia this October. So the way that I'm kind of wrapping this around in my mind is that we have all these different areas that people learn from and all these different avenues that we teach our students. How can we include that in each area, in LGBT healthcare in each area of those? So when we talk about curriculum, um, not just about HIV and AIDS. I remember I read a quote that um, 
someone stating, I'm not just, uh, as a lesbian, I'm not just about AIDS, you know, this is not who I am, I'm, I'm also a family planning, there's also a part of me that has a cardiovascular risk factors, there's preventative health care, there's much more to me than just um, uh, infectious disease. So being able to incorporate that, and especially the one aspect is gerontology. For a lot of out people that are growing older, uh, we're now, you know, impacted by, you know, health care as far as, and even housing, and the basic needs for these uh, aging um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender individuals. Um, it also stated um, within the <coughs> University of California, um, San Francisco, this model that they use is to have case studies throughout the um, curriculum focus on LGBT. So one of them in the first year is about a lesbian couple looking to uh, have a child. So it's going through a history taking for a couple that are looking to get pregnant. And how would you approach that? Um, in the second year, they talk about a, uh, an infant um, born inter uh, intersex. So having ambiguous genitalia. And how do you discuss that with a, with a parent? How do you approach that? They actually include advocacy groups, uh, intersex advocacy groups, as a part of that project. Um, they also have an SP encounter with a trans female that has abdominal pain. Um, it's interesting because the abdominal pain has no relation to her gender identity at all. And it really challenges the clinician or the student to, to look beyond that, okay, yes, this is a trans female, but this might have nothing to do with it. She probably just has dirt, you know? Like, there's, there's things that are uh, going on with that. Um, and there's also uh, program development, so encouraging uh, a mentorship between LGBT students and LGBT <laughs> staff. Um, also encouraging um, having um, it listed on admissions process if they have an LGBT experience or interest. To encourage these um, students to get involved in STEM uh, professions. Um, I actually uh, help with an organization called Out for STEM, so it encourages LGBT youth from 12 to 17 to encourage picking a STEM career, so science, um, technology, engineering, or math. So trying to get them involved because there is a lacking in those careers within the LGBT community. So really all of this will go into um, create, hopefully, a more diverse program, more prepared graduates, and positive patient outcomes which is really what we want. We want to arm our future physician assistants to be able to deal with it when they do encounter an LGBT individual. And I want, as a, as a member of the community, to go in to see my provider and expect that they have an education that will serve my needs and my family. So that's what I'm doing. Thank you so much.